what is the fundamental nature of the universe? Um, the West has a tradition, sort of Gnostic, although there's elements of it in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, even secular thinking, uh, that holds that the universe is essentially profane. Um, it's kind of a Manichaean kind of idea that the universe is a bad thing and that um, the best thing to do is to separate yourself from it in one way or another. Uh, the Gnostics sort of take it, I wouldn't say to an extreme, but they, they push it pretty far in the direction of an extreme, at least compared to everybody else. Um, India has its equivalent. The Jains, in particular, generally spring to mind when you um, think about people who split the universe into... Um, or uh, that actually split reality into the profane and the sublime. Um, the Jains seem to hold that the physical universe is fundamentally profane, or at least utterly undesirable. It's not, not a place we want to be. <clears throat> well, in my early 20s, I traveled extensively in India um, from uh, late 80s to early 90s. And India can sometimes get on your nerves as a Westerner, because uh, compared to everybody else, you're rich, uh, even if you're a backpacker like me, or compared to a lot of people back then. And, you know, you're always, people are always trying to sell you things. There's, uh, India is a noisy, crowded, polluted place often. It's often very quiet and serene. Um, and there's a place there called Mount Abu in southern Rajasthan, which is one such place. Very quiet, very serene very nice, or it was when I visited there. I don't know what it's like now. Um, people like it. It's a way to get away from the scorching heat of the plains. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a little resort. A lot of people go there for their honeymoons. Uh, you, you know, you go around Mount Abu, maybe slightly buzzed by the bang lassi, the marijuana drink that's legal in the state of Rajasthan and is somewhat, something of a holiday indulgence for some Indian people. Um, you know, you'd notice that it's a very pleasant place, and you see a lot of people taking their wedding photographs in the city. People go there for their honeymoons. It's rather nice, actually. Um, ironically, uh, Mount Abu also is, or was, the headquarters of this organization called the Brahma Kumaris, who believe that the universe is fundamentally evil and profane, and the best thing to do is to escape it and, um, if possible, destroy it. <laughs> there are um, rumors, persistent rumors, that the Brahma Kumaris would love to destroy this evil universe. In fact, during the period that I visited, it was the Cold War was winding down. And you could still see vestiges of them praying, essentially, or hoping for a nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the United States to bring this horrible age of, I don't know if they use the term Kaliyug, which a lot of Indians use to describe this essentially profane age, but basically this human age that we're living in is evil. And the sooner the world, the universe is destroyed, the better. <clears throat> which is kind of strange because when I was in Mount Abu, I, um, I was invited to visit their ashram, which I did. Now, it's kind of interesting because usually when you go to a Hindu temple or, you know, a visiting as a tourist or something like this, they'll show you around. They'll, you know, look for a little bit of bakshish money, um, Jain temples, that kind of thing. Um, almost alone in the Indian context, or I shouldn't say almost alone, but rarely in the Indian context will they try to convert you. Well, the Brahma Kumaris will try to convert you. I found them perfectly nice people if it wasn't for their shockingly disturbing point of view as I saw it. Um, you know, they, they preach celibacy, they preach uh, the coming apocalypse, they kind of remind me of the Jehovah's Witnesses or people like that. Um, they're not really as life-denying as one would call, say, a lot of the extreme ascetics that you see in India, people who cripple their bodies and starve themselves and do all kinds of bizarre things, which you do see quite frequently, or at least you did see back when I was there. Um, you'd see people, these fakirs, sadhus, they're actually called, um, just wrecking their bodies uh, in the name of um, overcoming this evil thing called the flesh. 
Um, although there are other reasons for these austerities, but there's also the element of revulsion with being encased in flesh. Um, <clears throat> now, as I said, it was an interesting juxtaposition between the happy honeymooners who are trying to get their, themselves knocked up for a nice sun uh, on their honeymoon. And here's me in my early 20s. Um, I did indulge in bang lassie, so I'm, I'm, of course, looking around like so many Western tourists did or do, thinking, my God, Indian women are just so stunningly gorgeous, they're enough to drive you out of your mind, etc. So, you know, I was not thinking celibate thoughts at the time. Um, you know, but here's the Brahma Kumaris who, you know, take Indian life denial to an extreme, to the point where it is alleged they would like to see the universe destroyed, and it is also alleged they have attempted to do so. Just an allegation, maybe. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, if you look at the way Indians live, even though their faith systems are often life-denying, well, when you see a bunch of people together chanting bhajans and you know, bouncing their kids on their knees with the images of the baby Krishna and that kind of thing, you sort of say, all right, well, there's an awful lot of room for riding the tiger of this existence. The, uh, you know, Indians are fairly enamored of sweets and <laughs> other pleasures of the flesh. Uh, they certainly are as obsessed with sex as anybody else is, even though they're more conservative about it, but they're, you know, they, they have libidos just like we do. And they like children and they have ambitions and plans. Um, and a lot of their religious practices reflect this. Um, I mentioned the Shaivites, who the extreme Shaivites are often really ascetic, like ascetic to the point of being disturbing. Um, but there are Shaivites who insist that the universe is always going to be around. There's no point in trying to get away from it. And when you consider the idea of samsara, the... Um, the way in which the non-physical, the soul, mind, whatever you want to call it, is somehow in, linked to the phenomenal universe, the profane material universe. Um, a lot of them say the best way to, to deal with that reality is not to try and abolish it the way the Brahma Kumaris would like to do, but to sort of ride the tiger, and that's tantric Hinduism. Um, tantric Hinduism is kind of, it's got a silly name in the West, i.e. sexual license. It's not like that at all. Well, there's a tiny element of it for, you know, really advanced adepts, I guess you'd call it. But by and large, it's just a means of using the physical universe to transcend the physical universe. In other words, use your body. Um, when you meditate, when you do yoga, when you do qigong, I guess, tai chi, um, when, um, you know, you go on a pilgrimage, you're walking somewhere, you're using your body in order to achieve release or to climb up the ladder of the levels of physicality. It's very arcane and it's one of the, Tantra is one of the parts of Hinduism that is the hardest for, I think, Westerners to wrap their heads around. It's the one that's fascinated me the most. I do yoga, so. Um, <clears throat> So, it's hard to generalize. You would, you would think, superficially, when you visit India, you see an extremely life-negating uh, faith. Uh, all of them. Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. Um, although Sikhism, not quite so much, but it's up there. Um, Hinduism, all this kind of thing. But when you see the way that people actually live their lives, uh, it becomes clear that Indians kind of like this universe. They're aware of, of its deep flaws and imperfections. But, you know, when, when you see how people actually live their lives, they're not really in a hurry to get out of here. And that's why I think the Jains have always remained a sort of a fringe group, and the Brahma Kumaris are, well, you ask most Indians about them, and the most Indian people will just go, you know, they're, they're harmless enough, but their ideas are pretty crazy, you know. I, I don't think that their ideas are any crazier than any other religions, to be perfectly honest. But that's just one of the interesting um, juxtapositions that one comes across when studying Hinduism or the Indic faiths. Do they hate phenomenal reality, or do they love it, or do they do both at the same time? 
Shiva again comes to mind. He's an ascetic and he's also an erotic. <laughs> um, which is it? Both, maybe, I guess. Um, now, there are strong elements of this in atheism as well. A lot of people sort of run out of steam, a lot of atheists, and I would call these people almost physicalists or people who worship scientism, I wouldn't say scientists, but you know what I mean, who say that the only purpose of our existence is to pass on our DNA and that's it, and it's, there's nothing else to any of this. Um, a lot of other atheists that I've spoken to say, oh, no, 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 I, I just don't believe in God. That's it. That's the only, that's my atheism. Uh, whether or not that reflects on the value of existence or the universe or whatever, um, or whether or not, you know, our purpose is to pass on our DNA or whatever, that really is nothing to do with my disbelief in God. These people actually are the atheists that I feel most at home with. I'm not an atheist, but I'm almost identical to those people who will say, um, yeah, I don't believe in God, but... <laughs> You know, I, it, it doesn't automatically mean that I believe that we live in a holy physical universe that has no meaning or no purpose or no nothing, that it's just a pile of mechanics and we're an accident. Um, we may indeed be an accident, but I don't see the universe as just an empty physical place. There's just, in my experience, there's simply too much evidence to the contrary. So, I'm wary of the type of atheist who results who resorts to scientism, um, physicalism, um, because inevitably that kind of, there's something in us, in my opinion, in humans that seeks more than physicalism. We want something more. Um, Nietzsche said it was the will to power. Some other people would say it's the will to meaning. The will to meaning actually strikes me as a, something I would like to pursue, and I have always pursued, I guess. Although I agree with Nietzsche, you got to make up your own meaning. I think the Hindus would agree with that. Um, no god is up there to give you meaning. But that doesn't mean there is no meaning. 